not just for Alzheimer's, but for all neurological related diseases. So, uh, so without further ado, I've taken my three minutes, but I'll further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Professor William Solomon uh, to kind of lead, lead our uh, panel discussion here. So, Bill? Yeah, I got it. Um, <laughs> um, so, just by way of introduction, I'll ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, I've been at Harvard Business School for 41 years, so I'm actually relatively easy to find, because uh, I, don't, I don't actually leave. Uh, <laughs> uh, nine or so years ago, I met uh, the two co-founders of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. And I must say, I fell in love with them as individuals and leaders but also was so uh, impressed by the possibilities of their science. I was also stunned uh, at how hard it is to get funded. And I have spent nine years trying to understand the process of funding labs. And then, as well, the process of trying to intervene to make the whole process, as John said, work more effectively. So I have continued to work with Maureen and Brock and David Stadden and Doug Melton uh, and folks like Brian. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is that I also decided I should know something about healthcare because it was consuming 18% of gross domestic product. And so I, I, I'm the only person you'll ever meet who's actually read the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> <laughs> uh, having uh, read it. Actually, uh, maybe the only person, including congressional. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they're actually, uh, to take Steve's point further, uh, lobbyists and congressional staff and I are the only <laughs> three <laughs> uh, who read and contributed to the Affordable Care Act. And uh, as we will discover, uh, there's a crisis looming, uh, a crisis looming on the science funding side and a crisis looming on the healthcare cost side, and as I think Janet will say, uh, a much deeper and more fundamental set of costs uh, that we don't actually take into account. So um, we'll have lots of time to talk about that. Janet, yes, tell us who you are, why you're here. Well, I'm here because Brock and John O'Leary asked me to join this panel discussion um, to bring the voice of the patient and the families into the room. And this is something that I do not uh, regularly, actually. Not long ago, as I was a keynote at a medical conference. The theme was palliative and end-of-life care, a fun topic. And as I spoke, I transitioned after starting off with some jokes. Um, I'm Irish, so we tell stories. I transitioned to talk with some candor about the last three years of my mother's life. When I was 35, I became legally responsible for both her and my father. She lived with Alzheimer's for 17 years, and she had cognition, by the way, at the end of the 17 years. But for 10 of the years, my son and I took care of her at home. So I spoke with candor about the um, lack of support that the medical system provided us in the last three years of her life, and the room of 300 physicians grew increasingly more still, not unlike what's happening here. <laughs> and at the end, there was this obvious pause before the applause began, and I looked around the room, and more than half of men and women alike were overcome with emotion. I didn't bring that speech bill. But afterward, one of the physicians came up to me, and he said something that is relevant for tonight. He said, Jen, you reminded us and when we diagnose a patient with Alzheimer's disease, the entire extended family has just been given the same diagnosis. So tonight we're talking about neurological diseases. We're talking about the child who's diagnosed with autism, the young man who's diagnosed with schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, ALS, MS. These are diseases that require an exhaustive amount of caregiving. And that is why, for the past 15 years, I focused on families. I'm trained as a nuclear chemist. I'm one of the few MBAs from Harvard who actually worked as a scientist pre-HBS on nuclear weapon systems. Irrelevant here. Um, post -HBS. That's the next group that's coming in. That's the next group. Um, but after graduation, I had the privilege of leading the Global 
Equal Quality Program for Bristol-Myers Squibb. Um, we focused primarily on the pharmaceuticals, and in one of my charges was to shorten the drug development cycle. And so I know firsthand the complications of taking a drug out of, a compound out of the lab through clinical trials, through the regulatory process, and <coughs> marketing it to the physician who will then prescribe it. It's a very long window of time. There's lots of failures. And so that is a part of what I can And, and certainly to. something certainly. we should talk about because science uh, is not where the process ends. <coughs> It needs to get into patients, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, but we can also open up the discussion. Before Steve Hyman uh, says anything, I will preempt him because he won't speak glowingly of himself, necessarily. Uh, but without, without, without Steve Hyman, and without Larry Summers, and without uh, a very supportive group, the Harvard Stem Cell Institute would not exist. And because it's now a thousand scientists uh, who've broken down some of the barriers we'll hear about, I think it's one of the seminal. So now, Steve, you can Thank tell you. us the <laughs> other stuff. Yeah. So um, a little bit about myself. So uh, uh, while I have an MD, I've been a basic scientist uh, my, for my entire career. Uh, I was doing very basic studies of gene regulation, and early in my life, too early actually, I got the strange opportunity to direct uh, an, one of the NIH institutes. So most biomedical research is funded in the United States, is funded by the National Institutes of Health. One of the problems we face is that the, uh, in nominal terms, the budget has been flat, except for the year that the sequestration actually occurred when it went down 5%. But against uh, inflation, NIH has lost uh, over the last decade perhaps a quarter of its uh, of its buying power, and uh, labs in all fields across the country are suffering. Postdocs tell us can't get jobs. People are being laid off, uh, and unfortunately, that you know we're going to lose I think, a generation of very talented young people. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, you know, in 1996 it was a different picture. Um, uh, I was convinced to do it. Uh, the then NIH director, Harold Farmus, uh, who was uh, one of the, won a Nobel Prize for the original discovery of oncogenes, uh, decided that, it, that instead of bureaucrats, he wanted younger active scientists running NIH institutes. Um, uh, and uh, it was an exciting period for me. Uh, in the end, NIH institute directors are the only people with real discretionary money in the US government. I had a budget when I left at 1.4 billion, and what paid a grant was, you know, lot of <coughs> but in the end was my signature, and you have a lot of say over priorities. Uh, but what happened to me uh, before I left is I got the translational bug. And I, I realized that um, um, just how bad things were, you know, I, I, today. So for these common severe psychiatric disorders, depression, schizophrenia, Passive illness, all the medicines we have today have the same molecular targets as the very first prototype drugs that were discovered serendipitously in the 1950s. Uh, so there really has been no progress. And I don't have to tell you about Alzheimer's disease. There really is nothing. I mean, there's some hope for current clinical trials, but there's really nothing. For autism, there's absolutely nothing except very labor intensive behavioral therapies. Uh, and uh, uh, but when I left the NIH in 2001, uh, I, I, I was actually despairing of, of, of making progress. The human brain is inviolable in life. We have these wonderful imaging tools. The only problem is they are three orders of magnitude uh, uh, away from the kind of resolution in time and in space that we would need to learn anything. And they don't give you the kind of molecular information you need to make medicine. <coughs> And animal models of human brain disorders are, have been really very disappointing. I mean, our brains are the last thing you know that has happened in evolution, and our rodent buddies, uh, who uh, <laughs> with whom we shared a common ancestor about 100 million years ago, are really quite different. 
So I took a little detour and I did do some good things. Uh, uh, Larry Summers recruited me to be uh, provost and chief academic officer at <coughs> the university. I was going to do it for five years and <coughs> help create interdisciplinary science. We had a little turbulence. I ended up doing it for 10 because you can't leave when things are bad. Um, uh, but uh, fortunately for me, during that 10 years, uh, technology, not, not scientific intelligence, but technology has cha changed enormously. And we can talk about this later, but what's happened is uh, the, the revolution in our ability to do genomics is incredible. And autism, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder are among the most heritable of all human disorders. So genetic analysis gives you clues. Um, and uh, uh, one of the miracles is that the cost of sequencing DNA has come down a million fold in the last decade. In fact, the cost of sequencing a whole genome by next year, where I am at the Broad Institute, will be about $1,000. The cost of data transfer and storage, my Amazon bill, will be $500. So the costs are actually converging. Um, stem cell technology. You know, if, if you can't make models in mice, how about human cells? And how about growing those stem cells into little organ blades and being able to genetically engineer them? And so and we can talk more about this. So, so there's a time now of light at the end of the tunnel for these illnesses, including Alzheimer's, including Parkinson's, <coughs> and the same kinds of technology. The problem in the interim that I'll stop with and we can talk about is that the pharmaceutical industry has decided that it's just too hard. The last diseases they're working on at the clinical level right now are these large Alzheimer's disease clinical trials, but what every head of discovery says is if these don't work, we're, we're out of here. I mean, we know that there's billions of dollars to be made if you have an effective disease altering treatment. But if we don't know how to get from here to there, you know, all we're going to do is, is burn our money. And in cancer, in contrast, very important problem also, we have lots of molecular targets and the pricing of cancer drugs, my God, is so attractive. So, uh, so even as we begin to make progress, um, there, there, we have very little reception in pharma. And as a result, less interest in venture capital because one source of liquidity is gone. And so, uh, so these brain disorders, which are the leading cause of disability in, on planet Earth, right? And it doesn't even count taking caregivers out of the workforce. Uh, don't, don't really have much investment at all anymore from, from industry uh, anywhere in the world. So on that uplifting note, <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I had the privilege of trying to be helpful uh, to, to a man named Judith Folkman, uh, a great cancer researcher who was told in his early days that he was a heretic and an idiot um, and who made major contributions to our understanding of the angiogenesis. But he also had this wonderful phrase uh, that if you're a mouse, I have good news. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and it turns out uh, the brain is a little bit uh, uh, different. People said it, there was no better time in history if you have if you're a mouse to have Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> <laughs> Which parenthetically they induce in the poor mouse. <laughs> Uh, Jeff Morby, a longtime friend, and um, at the Cure Alzheimer's Fund. Jeff. Well, first of all, you may have seen my head here. Um, I, I, I've been accused of having um, holes in my head. I now have a hole in my head. I just had a little uh, precancerous thing removed, so I'm, uh, that's what that is. Um, my name is Jeff Morby. I'm chairman of the Cure Alzheimer's Fund. Uh, my wife, Jackie, and I, Jackie is over here, and I <coughs> set up the Cure Alzheimer's Fund 10 years ago. And <coughs> we did it because uh, we were looking for something that we could do for humankind that would really make a difference. And we ran into a fellow whose name is Rudy Tanzi and uh, learned about his work uh, in Alzheimer's. Learned that Alzheimer's was creating a disaster in this, this uh, society of ours, that there were no cures, and that the new genomics maybe uh, held some uh, possibility of finding a cure. 
but there was no money to fund the genomic. So when we found that out, we uh, went back, we were living in Pittsburgh at the time, we went back to our home and decided to set up a foundation. We knew nothing about Alzheimer's, <clears throat> but we went to Rudy and we said, look Rudy, you put together the best team in the world of the best researchers in the world, and we'll fund you. And so we made that deal. And uh, part of the deal was he would uh, set up a strategy that uh, was designed with one objective in mind, which was to find a cure as soon as possible. <coughs> so we set up that foundation, and uh, we uh, realized quite early that Jack and I could finance at all, so we started looking for other families to uh, work with us to do this, and we found two other families that joined with us, and so we formed what is now known as the Cure Alzheimer's Fund. And from that point, we then began to fund research, and uh, we realized very early that to really understand Alzheimer's, you have to understand the gene. If you don't understand the genetics of the disease, you're just firing random shots and probably without any results. So we uh, did the first genomic scan of Alzheimer's, uh, about, I guess about a year after we set up the foundation. And we identified, that prior to this, there were four known Alzheimer's genes. We identified five more Alzheimer's gene, and we were, that was dubbed to be you know, one of the top ten medical breakthroughs in the world at the time. We then continued to um, try to understand what these genes were doing, and we, meanwhile, new technology came out, so we, with the new technology, we did another genomic scan about five years ago. And then, more recently, when the whole genome sequencing technology uh, came out, we did a third and first only whole genomic scan of, of Alzheimer's disease. And that was a $5.4 million uh, cost to us. And uh, we then uh, complemented that with a $400 million, or $4 million grant from the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, so, meanwhile, uh, our research has attracted the attention of many, many people. We now have about 25,000 supporters. Uh, two years ago, we raised $7.5 million for research. Last year, we raised $11 million, and we're projecting $14 million this year. And the reason is, is we're showing great results. And uh, you may have read about our Alzheimer's and Ditch breakthrough. That was funded by us. I can talk more about that later. And we've done some really seminal work on understanding the uh, relationship between Alzheimer's and the innate immune system, systems, which uh, we, uh, we're, uh, paper is just being published now on that subject. And uh, so we are on a roll. and. Uh, we expect to do pretty well in finding the next year. That's it. I, um, it's been a remarkable journey and a remarkable set of people and uh, structured in a way to break down the barriers and silos that uh, plague. Uh, by the way, they plague every kind of work. Uh, but uh, particularly in this one where we care deeply about reaching some uh, uh, outcome. Um, Brian, you're on the front lines. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, so I'm a physician scientist at, uh, at, at MGH, and um, I've, I've, I've worked using stem cell models for ALS, for Lou Gehrig's disease, and studying the, the disease in the dish using motor neurons derived from the stem cell technology from ALS patients. And what we found was that there's an abnormality of, of increased excitability in, in, 
and we, we, we think that this increased excitability contributes to motor neuron death, which is, which is the primary pathology in, in, in Lou Gehrig's disease. And so using, using the, um, the, the stem cell derived motor neurons, we identified an electrophysiological. Yep, that's all right. Go. No, Go. that's Go. okay. Go. Okay. We're going to translate a little bit. Yep, yep. Uh, they learned how to take a skin cell. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> trick it back into its embryonic state where it can turn into any of the 200 kinds of cells in the body. And then they learn how the, the recipe to turn it into a specific kind of cell. And in your case, you could characterize it, observe it, uh, study it in a dish. Is that right? Exactly. So this is the disease relevant cell type. So ALS is a disease of motor neurons. It's, it's, it's able to, the, the technology to, to take patients with ALS and to, to get motor neurons from those patients in the dish. And um, so what, what we found based on the, 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 electro, the electrical properties of the cells in the dish is that a particular existing drug might be, might be beneficial for correcting this, this abnormality. And we found that, that an existing FDA approved drug corrected those, those, those firing properties, and, but also improved the survival of the, of the cells in the dish. And now it turns out that there are also electrical abnormalities in, in the upper motor neurons, the motor neurons that, that live in the brain and control, um, control motor function, and the, the lower motor neurons, the motor neurons that live in the spinal cord and control motor neurons, both motor <coughs> motor function, both of these die in, in, in ALS. <coughs> And, and the same sort of abnormality that we were finding in the dish was, is, is present in, in, in the motor neurons in people using a clinical study, um, a clinical neurophysiological study. And so we've been very fortunate. I think one of the things you know, I want to talk about is, is, is how this happened, but we've been able to put together a clinical trial uh, in patients who have ALS using this drug and using the, the clinical neurophysiological outcomes as, as or measurements as, as outcomes for the study. And so this study is, is a, a first in kind in, in a number of, of ways. One is that it's a, a translation from stem cell work to the clinic without a mouse intermediate. <coughs> that's one thing that's, that I, I think is, is very interesting. A second is that we're going to make the stem cells, the immature, um, immature cells and then uh, and then convert them to motor neurons in the dish from the study patients. And so that will allow us to do have a comparison of the, the, the properties in the dish, the electrical properties of the cells in the dish, and the electrical properties in the patients. And that will that will allow us to ask questions like do the cells in the in the dish or analysis of the cells in the, in the dish predict uh, a response in patients. Can the, can the analysis of cells in the dish predict survival in patients? And you know these these kinds of things I think have have, have big uh, potential applications in, in how drug discovery can be done, how subjects for clinical trials can be recruited. You know one of the one of the I think really most um, most striking advances in medicine in the past few years has been the vertex and the vertex drug for for a subgroup a genetic subgroup of cystic fibrosis. You know, using the same idea of identifying subgroups who are likely to respond to specific medicines can can be can be um, uh, very powerful. And so the last thing I think that, that I want to say, which is just you know relevant here, is you know we were very lucky to be able to to to, to receive funding from a partnership that included HSCI, the ALS Association, GSK, and um, and MGH to fund the study. And we're also very lucky to have the, um, the, the clinical <coughs> network, basically an academic CRO that, that, that's, that sort of in a, in a, in a, in a, has the infrastructure to do this study. And so you know, next week, um, I'm, I'm doing the, the webinar for, with, with the ALS Association to introduce the study. And it's, it's, you know, it's about two years after I was squirting the drug onto cells in the dish. So you know, I've been really fortunate to be able to do that.
by spreading the cells in the dish, you have robotic arms that put in a specific amount into the large oh, no, numbers. No, no. no you were here. <laughs> uh, you can be replaced then. <laughs> There's a business yeah, opportunity here. Preston, <laughs> just quickly before we uh, get into it, maybe you could just tell us how a lab is funded. Sure. Uh, because uh, then maybe Steve can comment a little bit about the current funding mechanism for projects and we can understand how cure Alzheimer's or others are trying to uh, not uh, replace but rather supplement or, uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I think Steve is going to be able to comment in a lot more detail about, about the, um, the percentages and, 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 and how low they are. But, you know, most, most labs uh, are, are dependent on, on NIH for a, a major component of the funding. And, and I think just the, the, the lack of funding is one of the things that really holds up the, the, the ability to translate from one, from one domain to another. I think that's sort of one of the hardest things to do because it's, it's risky and, um, and you know, harder, harder even, even, even more difficult to get funding for those types of projects that I think are, are really most important. Also, you know, I think, so for example, I'm, I'm trying to look at how, look at similarities among neurodegenerative diseases, among ALS and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And, you know, because I think that, I think that there's certain, there's certain things that are easier to learn, or easier to study in one case, but may have uh, implications as far as understanding the other diseases. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to get funding for it. How much of your time do you spend trying to get money? Uh, 50, 40, 50, something like that. Yeah. So I, I just right want you to yeah. have in mind uh, someone with his training who spends 40 or 50 percent of their time writing 25 page single space size nine font. I don't know what the exact number is. No, that's right. Font and margin are specified. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the success rate for grant applications in some areas is down to 7%. Uh, and so, in, in effect, the. Uh, uh, so, it's just uh, remarkably hard. You have to um, send a lot of proposals in. Uh, maybe, uh, Steve, that would be a good point at which you could describe. Uh, there's been uh, a notion that as the demand for money has gone up and the pay rates, the success rates have gone down, that uh, the projects have gotten more conservative. Is that a fair assessment? So it's a very important point. What happens, so, so, so just to reiterate, it, it, uh, you know, philanthropy is so critical, but NIH is really the bedrock, you know, it's still all its travails, $30 billion, um, and it's what, especially young people, you know, you're already well known, you're at an elite institution, but the average young person isn't going to be able to get uh, philanthropic recognition, and they absolutely require uh, NIH funds. So two things have happened in this period of tight money. The first is exactly right. Grants are reviewed by what's called peer review. And peer review is a very strange process because the peer reviewers are scientists like all of us, but they get, you know, uh, uh, actually I think the HBS would have some very good sense of how group think sets in, but they, you know, they sit in a room. Because we're plagued by it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I know. Right. Insight. Right, if you're plagued by it, you might not have insight. Yeah. It might be terrific. But anyway. Um, uh, but what happens is, as money gets tight, people start prioritizing feasibility over, you know, the potential payoff, uh, because they don't want to be seen to be wasting uh, taxpayer funds. And the Congress makes this worse. The Congress, they love to make fun of grants with funny titles, <coughs> and, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and so, in fact, what gets funded is really relatively conservative. There's one other really problematic thing that's happened, though, is uh, the, uh, the, incumb the successful incumbents keep the money, right? And so the average age of when you get your first really independent workforce NIH grant, it's called an R01, 
has steadily increased uh, so that the average age now is 43. So, you know, most, you know, we're not physicists, we're theoretical physicists, but they'd be ready, you know, they'd be over the hill, over the hill right? Yeah. So, uh, but this is really a catastrophe because in an era of rapid technological change and a movement of life sciences from a largely qualitative to an increasingly quantitative field, uh, we need new blood. And, uh, and these two trends, which have been exacerbated by very tight money of, you know, the, the incumbents dominating uh, and, uh, and the increasing conservatism are very, very damaging to American science. Uh, Janet, I want to come uh, back. Can you give us a sense of numbers, if you would. Okay. How big a deal is this? What's the cost? And then i uh, get Jeff to describe a little bit about how they allocate money, how it might be different from that. NIH process. Okay, so the cost of caregiving. Uh, so oh, cost of caregiving, how many people have uh, so, diseases that, yeah. Okay, so first of all, the World Health Organization um, created a report with the World Bank and Harvard School of Public Health that said uh, neurological disorders are one of the greatest threats to public health globally. And they estimate 1 billion individuals have a neurological disorder. So that puts it in one scale. In America, we estimate there are 50, and again, I'm going to talk about aging, not neurological, well, the whole bucket, because this is really my area, is the aging space. But we estimate, I, I'm into it. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there are estimates there are 55 to 80 million people in this country right now are actively supporting someone over the age of 50. Uh, Two-thirds are women, no surprise. The average person is a 70, 47-year-old woman. Right? Well, you also outlive so, us. I, you outlive us. Well, that's right. not necessarily you know? good. Then we also have all, uh, yeah. Alzheimer's at a higher rate, not because mm -hmm. of it, but that's, yeah. that's a piece of it. Um, so that's huge. Um, we know that right now the 24% um, of seniors will need help for eight years or longer, and most of them have neurological diseases. So the average senior, I have an 88-year-old mother-in-law, she's going to need help likely for two years. She's still living on her own in an apartment. One to two years is typical for 60%. But that larger bucket is growing significantly faster than 24%. 45% of all mid-career individuals, men and women alike, will have their careers disrupted or derailed by the needs of an older relative. 10% quit or retire early, 17% take a leave of absence, and Noria's wife took a leave of absence. Let's not talk about what happened to her career when she did. Um, very classic scenario. 60% of people arrive late, leave early, take vacations. Um, so we're talking about an impact on careers. Uh, we're talking about an impact on finances. 62% of all baby boomers will run out of money before the end of their lives. Think about Alzheimer's, 8 to 12 years duration. Right now, there are only 5.7 million people who have Alzheimer's. That's not a big number, but it accounts for $230 billion worth of caregiving. Half of the caregiving dollars spent in this country are spent on just that disease alone. And if we don't do anything to attenuate the buildup of protein in the brain, I mean, it's, it's, we know what causes Alzheimer's, then 16 to 17 million of the baby boomers who are asymptomatic right now will have Alzheimer's over the next couple of decades, and we will collectively pay as a nation $1.1 trillion just for their care alone. So this is why 15 years ago, I looked at going into the research, I looked into going to fix health care, and I decided what really needs to happen is we need to educate families on how to successfully navigate the aging journey with their elders, especially those who have neurological diseases. Because unfortunately, the pace of research is not likely going to get there before the boomers arrive with Alzheimer's. And again, this excludes <coughs> other issues of other neurological diseases. So, yeah, so uh, over to Jeff to. Well, hold on. Uh, 
we always need to have a light moment between every speaker. <laughs> I'm reminded again uh, by Judah Polkman, who had the highly uplifting comment he would make to you, which is, there are 400 tumors in your body as we speak, <laughs> waiting to recruit blood vessels to grow. Well, Please don't such... say that. <laughs> Say of the Affordable Care Act, uh, it was reform of access to insurance, not reform of access to affordable health. And affordable is a very broad category. It speaks to the issue of all of the consequences. When we talk about $3 trillion devoted to health care, we ignore essentially all of what we're talking about in terms of its broader implications. So Jeff, uh, you all um, are venture capitalists. Basically, right. so how do you decide where to uh, spend money? How, what's a high potential but potentially risky bet? How do you think about that? Yeah, sure. Well, the way we organize our research uh, decisions, uh, first of all, we have a it's called a roadmap, which is our research strategy. And that roadmap is reset uh, periodically based on what the findings uh, occur. And once a year, we get together with all of our researchers and we have a brainstorming session and we say, how should we change our roadmap to what should we be doing? And then we have a quarterly meeting with them, telephonically also. Uh, so we're, the roadmap is a living document. It's constantly changing as new information is found. Now when we um, fund a particular research project, we have this research consortium who, uh, with the Rudy Canopy, our top guy, will conclude that this research project is consistent with the roadmap and is what we should be doing next. So that comes to us uh, as the executive committee, but we have another group of people within the organization, which is our scientific advisory board. And the scientific advisory board has two Nobel Prize winners on it. They are totally familiar with our strategy. They stay up to date. So the research grant goes, the request goes to us, but it goes to the scientific advisory board. And they analyze it in terms of its consistency with the strategy and the quality of its uh, research. If they like it and we like it, we go ahead. Uh, now that contrasts with the idea of sending out peer review uh, documents out. We can make a decision in a month, whereas the peer review process takes forever. We also have total consistency because we have the same people in the scientific advisory board know their strategy, know what we're doing, and so we have a very consistent process of making decisions on funding, and it's also strategically driven. So, and it's very fast. We made the decision, for example, to do the whole genome sequencing in about a month. Uh, we learned about the new technology, we realized how important it was, and let's go. We all uh, gulped and uh, increased our funding personally by 50%, so we can do it. And uh, so we have a very fast process. We're not constrained by trying to impress anybody, so we uh, try to invest in the best things that look like their breakthroughs and so forth. So we can think of ourselves 
as a venture capitalist investing in new companies that are highly risky with lots of potential. <coughs> if we hit something, we then will go to the NIH and say, okay, we have this great potential product, can you help us? And right now we have a uh, very attractive potential medication that's going to go into human trials this year. It's called the gamma sequence modulator. And it's uh, one of Which them. only Brian and Steve actually know. <laughs> well, somebody else. But modulating that stuff seems good to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. Uh, so in any case, but this attacks the uh, generation of amyloid. Uh, a lot modulates it. Uh, in any case, if you see what's called a uh, blueprint grant from the NIH, they only give uh, 10 a year or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And so they are now funding the development of this medication. And they're going to take the, uh, uh, the medication through stage two trial. So that's a good example of how we leverage our money. So we took the high risk bet to develop the medicine, and then they, they're helping us. So, Think of us as a venture capitalist and the NIH is the bank. Okay. So, so, so that's the way we work. It, it, yeah. <coughs> and it's a fabulous model, and if we looked at uh, multiple myeloma research foundation, the Stem Cell Institute, Michael J. Fox, many people, Matt, and uh, we have all collaborated uh, to uh, understand the process. It's, it's tremendously important, and we found Steve, you just got a, sort of a Whopper gift yeah. grant of yeah. all time. Yeah, it's true. And relative to the absolutely paltry funding in uh, the area, tell us a little bit about how you're going to, what are you going to do with it? Yeah, so it's it? it, it an interesting story, which is, uh, uh, first of all, from the point of view of the philanthropist, Ted Stanley, he had had a foundation, I mean, very unlike what you described, that he became disgruntled with and wanted to do something more like what you were doing. He came to it, he had over 20 or 30 years been making grants with a, with a very good scientific advisory board, grants at sort of $100,000 for two years, you know, and, and uh, he felt, looking back, that, you know, some young people's careers advanced and, you know, so there were certainly some good papers, but there was nothing to show for it in the sense that, you know, these were small increments against the large background of NIH, and it wasn't cumulative, it wasn't managed. And he had, uh, my, my uh, predecessor at this, uh, what's the, called the Stanley Center, which is at the Broad, the Broad is a very interesting place, it's a Harvard-MIT joint venture, uh, based, you have to be a Harvard or MIT faculty member. It's driven by technology platforms. It's very collaborative, uh, and we uh, we were, uh, you know, I, I, I stepped into the directorship of this center and had a view that uh, I I didn't want to be frittering money away, but I really wanted to manage it, and I had the view that um, we had to be orderly that. Uh, research in brain disorders uh, had been uh, failing because we had to make a lot of guesses about what the me mechanisms of disease were, and the, uh, the clearly the, the genomic technologies and computing technologies we now have made it possible in all of these disorders, and Rudy is just a terrific example of success, uh, to, to begin to, to understand these molecular mechanisms, and then again, you know, when you have tens or hundreds of genes, each contributing a little increment of risk, you have to study those in uh, a system that permits high throughput. And you need a system, we've been making fun of poor mice, you know, they're doing fine actually, uh, uh, a system of human biology. And so the stem cell technologies, even though, you know, stem cells in a dish are a very long way from a human brain, allow you to study many, many genes very readily uh, as opposed to making a transgenic mouse, which isn't going to give you an interesting result anyway, uh, and because it's, a, and it's also a human system. So I started doing this, and and, uh, and one day, uh, the, the Ted's person called me up and said, do you think you could spend a lot more money? Um, 
Yeah, so I said, yeah, I, yeah, of course. I'll uh, call you back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it turns out what he was looking for, what they'd been watching us, was they wanted something that could be cumulative, that would be managed and not simply making a thousand small bets. Uh, and of course, it had to have a credible platform, which was uh, genomic, the same conclusion you've come to. Um, and so, you know, last year I had a budget of, you know, something in the neighborhood of $50 million. Won't be that good every year, but that's not a bad budget. And, you know, um, genetics is scalable, and, and we can really speed it up. And, uh, you know, we had been doing genetics with uh, mostly Scandinavian population registries, amazing Orwellian healthcare systems uh, that are wonderful for scientists, but they're a tiny slice of human genetic diversity. And so now we've started collaborations in Japan, in Sub-Saharan Africa, very important. The University of Cape Town actually can, has almost enough infrastructure to work with us, a collaboration in Mexico, a collaboration with a, some population isolates and so forth. And, and because the technologies are scalable, you know, you just have more and better machines doing the DNA sequencing. You know, we're building this platform. We're also making stem cell libraries with lots and lots of these genes. And, and the idea, and I think this is really critical, and, I, and our, again, our philanthropist, this is actually a good philanthropist, is hopes that you have all the incentives you need, but above all wants to solve the problem. Whereas a lot of the incentive system in science is to uh, hide the data, to exploit it, to get the next grant and the next grant. Yeah. So one of the things I had always insisted on was that all of the genetic data be made public as completely and rapidly as possible. And then when we have these genetic stem cell libraries, that they also be, that we, one of the things I want to do is industrialize their production so that's it, more robots, less sure. people, so that we can make those available. So that's what, that's the kind of, but you think at a different scale, you're trying yeah. to coordinate and get a cumulative impact, increasing uh, returns to scale. Right, and, and, and recruiting other people into the field, including hopefully farm. Yeah. We yeah. should give homage to yeah. George Church, by the way. Just uh, He's often in the room, but not mentioned. Uh, but he and a number of scientists have made such extraordinary uh, advances so that the cost of Sequencing makes Moore's law look slow by yeah, comparison. Yeah. And without that, a lot of what we're doing. No, we couldn't, about wouldn't be scalable. The first genome, I don't know, it's maybe an exaggeration, the genome probably cost $3 billion. That's not scalable. Right? But when there were $1,000, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, I, want, I wanted to say something relative to what you're talking about. That is, for, for these diseases uh, that have multiple for example, uh, Alzheimer's is a disease of multiple genes. So you can't simply study one of these genes because it's their interactions that bring about the problem. So um, we have now a project <coughs> underway called Genes of Therapy. We've identified the top 20 genes that come out of our database of 100 genes. And we're proceeding with that analysis sequentially. So we're taking five genes at a time. It's gonna cost us two to three million dollars per gene mm -hmm. to really thoroughly analyze it. So if you take our funding of, let's say, 10 million dollars a year, it's gonna take us five years to get through this. So if we had double the funding, we could get through it in two and a half years. Or less, because yeah. we have new yeah. processes. Exactly, and then the other thing is you can do parallel processing. You can see the interrelationships yeah. among these genes, whereas if you proceed sequentially, you cannot do that. So there's a lot of good arguments for putting a lot more money into this stuff for that reason. So I love Rudy Tanzi, but uh, one time I went to a baseball game with Rudy, and he doesn't actually allow you to watch the baseball game. He talks about the genes he hasn't had the opportunity to, to, to the physical clothing 
the Chiefs. <laughs> so you sort of like have to have a different mentality when you go to the baseball stadium. Actually, I was at a scientific lecture he was giving when the Red Sox were in the World Series, and uh, he, he was always interrupting with the baseball. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he does the opposite. <laughs> that sounds like the multitasker. Tell us a little bit about this. Um, you guys were able to create a specific brain cell that went awry. Um, ultimately, we've now had these advances where we can use uh, lasers and other mechanisms for measuring activity at a scalable level. How do you see this evolving? Are we going to have a, a more complex system uh, for a brain? We can now uh, create a, a heart. You, you de uh, cellularize a heart and you put some embryonic cells and it knows where to go. It populates the heart and the heart starts to beat. Yeah, so I think, I, I think two, so two points. One, one I think that um, in all of these neurodegenerative diseases, there's not just the neurons. Although, although we think of the neurons as the, the, the victims, the, the cells that are dying, there's, there's also an intricate, um, intricate network of, of supporting cells of, of different kinds of immune cells and, 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 um, and, and supporting cells and these, these different cells ha uh, may contribute to, to the death of, in the case of ALS, uh, motor neurons and actually in, in certain, certain genetic variants of, of ALS a number of people think that it's primarily a disease of these supporting cells and the motor neurons are, are dying because of, of, of the toxicity of, of these supporting cells. So, you know, I think the, the big question is, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, the, neur the neurons derived from, from stem cells, uh, the, they're neurons, but they're not, they're not in their, their full environment. They're not, they're not like, like, like the whole brain there. And it's not like having the whole brain in the dish. And the question is, you know, what is, what is necessary in order to model the disease effectively? You know, can you do some things with just the neurons? For say epilepsy, do you need to have networks of the neurons? Uh, for a neurodegenerative disease, do you have to have the different <coughs> population components that that ultimately lead to um, to, uh, to 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 neurodegeneration? I think you know one of the things that's that's really most fascinating is how you can have in diseases like Alzheimer's and ALS. There's 15. There's something like 15 uh, single genes that can cause. The disease, and they they're in different subgroups. So somehow there's this convergence of, of different genes onto a, a, a clinical phenotype of, of motor neuron disease. And so I think that you know that 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 trying to understand what is different and then what is what is common about these pathways is, is really important. And hopefully being able to target that convergence as for 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 therapy. The other thing I would say, just as far as these, these cells in the dish, is, is you know, with regard to having a, having a phenotype and then being able to screen, and whether that's with a motor neuron or with, with, with a combination of different types of cells. But you know, instead of having sort of one target that's, that, that is used for drug-based screens, being able to have, have a phenotype that, that you're confident is disease-relevant, and that allows you to do things like combinatorial screening. So, Evaluate maybe if you have two different drugs and and you know there's a, a symbiotic relationship where you're getting you know getting getting uh, the, the sum is greater than than uh, than, uh, than the parts um, or together they're greater than the sum of the parts um, uh, and, and you know being able to evaluate that in a dish and you know practically there's no way to do that in clinical trials because the combinations are, are just so many and even in a mouse trial. So this is in parallel, actually. So the, the fascinating part of this is that people are going through a clinical experience, uh, getting treated. You're studying their cells and how they are evolving, how they might differ across different uh, uh, patients. So uh, I'm mindful that we have a lot of very smart people uh, in the audience. And uh, I could keep asking questions roughly forever. Um, so let's not do that. So. What's on your mind? Yes. Um, I was intrigued by an early comment uh, by one of the panelists um, that made me think of another comment by another panelist. And that is, you know, on one on the one hand, we have sort of like 
hands off from the big pharma company. On the other hand, there's some intriguing evidence of immune system, autoimmune system may be you know, at play here. And that's an area of huge investment and research yeah. on the part of the big pharma companies. You know, when's life going to... Uh, so it's a very good question. So uh, just to, to, so it's not nebulous, you know, in, in the brain, there's a cell. So, so nobody ever wanted to study these supporting cells. They were marginalized, probably depressed. And uh, the, uh, the, 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 the representative of the immune system in the brain is something called a microglial cell. And people thought that they were pretty boring, that when cells died in Alzheimer's or in uh, ALS, they just took out the garbage. Uh, but it turns out that it's very likely that they're actually playing a naughty role in these diseases. And we're beginning to be able to discover them. And it's true, people who've been studying autoimmunity and immune therapies have a lot of tools that we could use. And uh, so, so even if they're not in the brain disorder business, you would think it would be pretty straightforward for them to share some of those tools. And that turns out to be uh, not the case. They, you know, they're very protective because they're developing this, say, for rheumatoid arthritis or a lupus, and they don't want you to screw it up and find a side effect that they'll have to explain to the FDA. And uh, I like think that it cures Alzheimer's. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, no, it's, it's that. So the NIH has a program for repurposing existing drugs and so forth, but it's a very limited set. And I think many of us are uh, still trying to deal with this problem of, you know, getting people to share key tools uh, that would uh, potentially benefit these areas of brain. Any comment on the uh, um, innate immune system? Um, it turns out that uh, we have a paper that's uh, going in the press that uh, shows that we think uh, demonstrably shows that the amyloid in, uh, in the brain is part of the innate immune system. The amyloid is part of the innate immune system. And we've um, done a lot of studies with respect to amyloid. And it, um, it's lethal. It kills all kinds of bugs. Uh, it, it kills staph, it kills <coughs> pneumonia, it, and it's as powerful as some of the standard, uh, well-known, uh, you call it uh, the, uh, the, 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 the term is the people, type of um, standardized meds that will kill various antibiotics. Uh, yeah. So uh, it turns out that it's very, very powerful as a protection of the brain. And it also um, it kind of works this way. If you have a, you know, an energy brain, uh, the brain generates amyloid. The amyloid attacks the pathogen and sequesters it and kills it. Uh, but if you have defective genes, you get an overreaction. So you get more amyloid than the brain needs. And that amyloid may not be cleared out of the brain because you have another defective gene that doesn't do a good job. Your microglia might not work very well. So uh, I think we will demonstrate conclusively that this is the case. Now what is interesting, however, is we think this may be a universal cause of many of the uh, neurological diseases. So you have similar amyloid substances in diabetes. We've done a lot of work on diabetes. Uh, same with Parkinson's. And so it may be that this, this uh, insight we've had with respect to the Alzheimer's may be applicable to a number of the neurological diseases. Brian, you <coughs> have the capability of commenting which would be a good time to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I, I actually don't have too much to do with that. I, mean, I, I think that 
Yeah, I think that there's a, a lot of emphasis on, on understanding the immune system and, and the supporting cells and, and neurons as innocent bystanders in, in some of these uh, in some of these diseases and setting up the models to uh, to, to investigate that and, and to uh, and, and to, and to try to prevent it. We have this new uh, technology that Doug Melton has developed to create. Uh, uh, glucose measuring insulin producing beta cells that might be transplanted but because it's the immune system that attacks those cells then it becomes a problem of how do you make it so that they can survive and do the work that they need to do and so across everything uh, uh, it will turn out inflammation uh, amyloids all of this stuff will turn out to be critical theories about, um, well, I, I guess the most well-established would be sickle cell. You know, this idea that we have these these alleles that aren't helpful in this setting, but that in Africa, for example, they were, they were helpful and there's a reason for their evolutionary purpose. I've heard the same idea with respect to Alzheimer's, that certain genes that lead to it helped uh, in, in times of famine for um, individuals to survive during fetal life and early infancy. And that if, for example, the conditions of famine are later changed in the same individual and food is plentiful, then it's a maladaptive trait. So I was wondering, you know, if, if there is any development in you know, this idea yeah. of genetic modulation. Well, and it's, it also, it's, yeah, it's ba balancing selection, right? So that's exactly what you said. So the sickle, you know, evolution only cares about the number of children you produce that survives. Uh, right. And Too so... If you have a recessive gene that gives you a one in four chance of uh, having sickle cell anemia and dying, but you're in an area with an endemical area, um, and you have a one in two chance of being relatively protected from malaria, um, that sickle gene will be selected. Uh, the, the, the challenge with um, all of these, so, so something like this is very likely true based on evolutionary theory. But when you have illnesses that are caused by the interaction of tens or scores or hundreds of genes, uh, it's really hard to pin down why this gene or that gene or the other gene has remained common in the gene pool. But, you know, but for, for common flavors of genes, common alleles, which are very much involved in Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, uh, just it's the infelicitous combination that is uh, so bad. Uh, you know, the, you know, many people who don't have these diseases will have these risk right. variants. You just have to assume that at worst they're neutral, but they may actually have some benefit. So to, so to take this general theory yeah. and now make it a little bit more specific, one of the more common alleles supposedly is the apo 4 right? Mm -hmm. That has to yeah. do with um, cholesterol metabolism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, so in, the, in this discussion of um, the immune system, you know, there's a relationship that's been well established between the immune system and between fat cells, actually. You know, people used to think that fat cells were inert, but they actually, there's actually this class of adipocytokines, this interaction between, between the metabolism and the immune system. So I was wondering, are there developments in this regard, in terms of drug development? People think that statins, so, right? So, so let me, th 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 this is a side point, but it's very interesting as a, in, in terms of the, the infirmities of science. So apo, if you have two ApoE4 alleles, uh, your risk of Alzheimer's goes up what, 15 times. Yeah, 15 fold. Yeah. If you have two, and five fold if you have one yeah. copy. And then there's a protective allele, and then there's a sort of neutral allele. Uh, we've known this for, well, more than 20 years. And, but everybody worked on amyloid, and ApoE had almost no attention, and certainly none from pharma, because everybody was so sure that uh, amyloid by itself would be the answer, and it was easier to work on because there were these processing enzymes that could be inhibited or modulated. Because if you inhibit the gamma sequence, other bad things happen, right? Oh, not, not in our... No, no, it's a modulator. <laughs> 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 Uh, uh, um, uh, and, uh, and all of a sudden, as people have gotten more pessimistic about the current drugs that, uh, that target amyloid processing, interest in ApoE 
alleles has finally broken out. But there's a, there, there is, um, there, there, it was almost like a global group thing. I mean, it's really a very strange thing to, to ignore this low-hanging fruit, even yeah. if it was scientifically challenging. It's really interesting because I agree with you. Uh, when we first started out, uh, it was kind of obvious uh, half the people with Alzheimer's have AP morphine. And yet we weren't doing very much in houses. And so actually that's one of the advantages of having venture captains involved. We started pushing this. So we're doing a lot of work now with AP before. But I do want to answer this question, uh, which is a really very interesting. You have APOE2, APOE3, and APOE4. You have APOE2, and APOE is felt to be involved in clearance out of the brain of the M1. So APOE4 is thought to be a very poor clearer. So you have, if you have gene X over here that's generating too much amyloid, and if you have APOE4 over here, uh, that's a bad combination get too much amyloid here, and you don't get it generated out of the system. Uh, APOE3 is uh, better, much better, and most of the people, uh, I guess 60% uh, of the population has APOE3, and then APOE2 is better <coughs> yet, and then that's a small percentage, maybe 5%. About 20% of the population have APOE4 genes. So 20% of the population have APOE4, 50% of the people with Alzheimer's have the APOE4. Well, it turns out that, that in the old days, when it became that caveman days, APOE4 was the only gene. And over time, it's evolved. First, uh, there was APOE3 and then APOE2. And so, uh, if you look at the evolutionary causes of this, it turns out that APOE4 is a pretty protective gene in tough circumstances. For example, if you Starvation. if you look at, uh, for example, there was a study done of the poor children in favelas in, in uh, Brazil. And it was found that those children with APOE4 genes survived much better than the children with APOE3 and APOE2. So, but, so when you're a caveman, it's very protective, uh, but... Until you, there's a McDonald's next to your cave. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so what has happened is, as people have uh, aged and started eating fat things and so forth, APOE then becomes a detriment. But in, in that sort of environment, it's a positive. Uh, Brian, maybe you could just make a, a quick comment about what gene editing is. Sure. and how it might uh, play a role in some of the things we were just hearing about. Sure. Because sure. it's come on with a huge... Yeah, so it's really just been just a revolution in the, in the, in the scientific community in the past couple of years. And so when we do these types of stem cell modeling experiments where we have neurons from someone with a disease and neurons from someone without a disease and we compare them, we don't. We want to know for sure that any sort of difference we're observing is really due to the disease and not due to, for example, other genetic variants between the, um, the, the people or artifacts due to the, this, this uh, process that you described so nicely of going from the from the skin cells to the stem cells and then back to the, back to the back to the neurons. And so one way of doing that is is the so-called gene targeting approach. And this allows you to take a particular set of stem cells and introduce a specific mutation to say, let's say, correct a disease-causing gene. And then you can then you can make the, the neuronal type of, of, of interest, uh, whether it's a cortical neuron in Alzheimer's disease or motor neuron in ALS, and you can know that you have one set of cells and the other set of cells, they're identical except for that disease-causing mutation. Um, and so that, you know, that is sort of a, a very powerful tool now to, tool to, to, um, to give these, these, these uh, models more weight. If I could just add, you know, one, one more comment about what you're saying. I think, you know, what, what groups like, 
like the Broad and, and Rudy's, Rudy's group had is where you have, you know, validation of, of, of in human genetics that specific genes are important to disease and that, you know, there are, are, are people who have mutations in the, in the genes that protect and mutations in the disease that, that, that um, you know, lead to, in the genes that lead to disease, it validates that gene is really important as opposed to, I think, a lot of, a lot of um, science where there just isn't that guidance. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's really uh, becoming, becoming clear now that the research that's sort of guided in that way is, is, is I, I, I think, most likely to lead to, to problems. There's also a broader point, which is we throw away uh, petabytes of data every day. So you might study the uh, evolutionary introduction of different genes in response to different long-term environmental influences. But uh, we don't capture any of the, uh, this. We don't link it to genomic profiles, although Rudy has a, and lots of people are trying to create these uh, linked uh, databases. So it's a, it's a condemnation in part of we worry more about billing than we worry about collecting and assessing the information. And uh, thank goodness for the Icelanders. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes? So I, I wish we had had you know, this discussion two years ago with my, met my husband, who's a neurobiologist, <laughs> and uh, with the academic route. And when I found out about the average age for them to get their R01, he was 28 and had a first child. And I said, wait, 40 what? And he said, did I mention that? You know, he's applying for his first time this year. So we'll see how that goes. Oh. We're in the 37. So we'll see how that goes. But I had a question and we're sort of talking about the funding models and where we go, particularly for us as, you know, the HBS crew here. Are we looking then at, you know, the STAR model for, for what you're doing, Jeff, versus should we all sort of have a VC that's directly tied to a pro from a higher med school to MGH, like where can we sort of see things going and, and try to sort of play? Well, you're this? asking a good question. Yeah, uh, because, sure, so uh, <laughs> and uh, I need your help too. Everybody tell me. We, um, we decided when we started this foundation not to uh, try to get the intellectual property. The reason for this was we didn't want to slow the process up down. We wanted to speed it up, and we also didn't want to get in the process of having to negotiate the sort of deal every time we funded something. So we said our objective is to find a cure, not to make money off this, and so we decided not to try to claim intellectual property. Well, now we've done a lot of funding of very good things, and there's intellectual property out there. Harvard has a bunch of it. It's all over the country. We don't have any rights to it at all. And uh, we are now at the process, uh, process now where we're trying to raise a lot of money. Uh, for example, we have something called the Genes to Therapy Program. It's looking to take 20 genes and, and <coughs> analyze the heck out of them. That's going to take 50 to $100 million. Uh, we're funding at a $10 million level, but that'll take five years if we could double that, we would really speed this thing up. And, uh, but we don't have much to offer anybody. We can't say, here's some intellectual property. If you put some money into it, we'll get 15% of the bank. So we're trying to figure out now how to move to that next stage, which is bring in a pharma or something like that. And we haven't figured it out yet. We've had some meetings with venture capitalists recently, but we haven't figured it out. Can you figure it out? Well, I, I think two observations. First is that um, patenting and licensing in the life sciences had, is mostly a stumbling block, and only rarely does it lead to real value. And that university technology transfer offices, in many places, that actually don't pay for themselves, uh, but they sure do slow down uh, the march of science. And I think um, we're at a stage, this, by the way, this is not going to happen because this would require legislation, but 
really rethinking the, the fundamental model that uh, creates progress in the life sciences would be very, very helpful. Um, on the one hand, you wish you had you know, the funds that might come if uh, one of these uh, discoveries got licensed, and especially if it hit a gusher, then you'd really regret not having intellectual property. Brown and Goldstein never had any intellectual property on what led to the statins, you know, uh, uh, Lipitor. Yeah. Um, and the University of Texas is probably still, they probably cry every night. Uh, but well, mainly but because the price of oil is 40 yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> Those are the two reasons. But, but if you had started out, I think you made the right decision, because if you had started out, you know, dealing with all of these tech transfer offices, it would have really, yeah, crazy. yeah it would have slowed everything down. Yeah. So we're in a bad place with respect to IP. We're in a bad place, parenthetically, even within Harvard, where Mass General has a separate mm -hmm. TLO, and right. Harvard has a separate TLO, and it's not clear that that all is working. And when the scientists collaborate, yeah, when the scientists collaborate, sometimes the offices will fight over who gets to file and be controlling. I'm just having that fight right now with our campus. What, what a treat. Yeah. <laughs> and again, as you say, it seems like it's over stuff that is so unlikely to you. Often. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. the Kissinger line about the faculty meeting fights are so vicious because the stakes are so low. <laughs> <laughs> so these, are, these are the kinds of things you can do in academic humor. <laughs> so I keep hearing a refrain, so, so close and yet so far. Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of the drumbeat. And, and so I'm wondering some bottom line questions. If, whenever you venture a guess to how close are we if we didn't have the money issue, if we didn't have the option, if we had you know, as much money as was needed, how soon might there actually be um, something that looks like a treatment or yeah. So I hate to be a, um, a killer, but I'd start with the fact that, uh, on average, once a drug company has a lead compound, um, if everything goes well, it's nine years before it's marketed. Is that, is that something where, that's optimistic? That's extremely Yeah, that's extremely optimistic. All right, so... Um, so that's what we had today. Yeah, if you had the, you know, the lead compound. So. Um, I would say if we are, I, Alzheimer's is, is, is a somewhat farther along, I think, but, uh, but uh, for, you know, uh, some of these other, you know, autism, where we're, we still don't, we're, we're still really in the early stages of sorting it out. Unfortunately, I would say 20 years, if we're very, very lucky, 30 more. So what I would do is uh, have a 50% increase in IH <coughs> funding, uh, probably gradually, because when you bump it up quickly, it does all sorts of bad yeah. things. Mm -hmm. you know? But I would say that uh, we ought to also give four or five billion dollars to be allocated by group. <coughs> in other words, I, you need a separate mechanism, because without that uh, process, I really don't think you can make uh, and parenthetically, just to put the four or five billion or ten billion, four or five billion is what the NIH spends on all neurological and uh, yeah, mental five, diseases. Five billion on all neuroscience, so the disease-oriented parts and fraction. So uh, j just you know, again, go back to the hundreds. Jan, what did you say the cost of Alzheimer's is? Two hundred billion. Two hundred billion dollars. One point one trillion. So if you just think about the juxtaposition of those two numbers. If you were back in first year finance, you would receive a category three or low pass, depending on what year you graduated. Uh, but it would not be a high grade. Um, so, look, I'm, I'm mindful that we're at eight o'clock. I'm also mindful that, um, that we've had the benefit of an extraordinary panel uh, that uh, has given us insights all the way from what does this mean in, uh, to humans, uh, to their families, and to the people afflicted, but also some insight into interventions and ways to organize to do something uh, and to accelerate the progress that we all aspire to have. So it may not be for us, it may be for our children or their children, but I think that ought to be part of our 
mission is to make it better for them. So thank you all so very much for coming.